Right, well, I'd like to start by saying, wow, thank you. Um, I was absolutely astounded when I got the letter through saying that I was being invited to be the Dunster lecturer. It was one of those moments that really is a career high. And it's one of those moments that gets you to, to reflect a little bit on how on earth that came about. How did I end up standing in front of all of you guys today? Um, I'll say a few words about that as I go through my talk this morning. Obviously, I'm going to be talking to you about learning from Chernobyl, the lessons that we can learn from the Chernobyl exclusion zone. And as I talk to you about that, I'm going to identify some of the, the challenges and also the innovations that have been brought forward to help improve our ability to learn from Chernobyl. Obviously, this is very much the theme of the conference, the use of innovations, the recognition of challenges, as we move towards delivery of practical radiation protection. A major challenge that I will highlight is the interpretation of radiation effects research undertaken within the Chernobyl exclusion zone. And in particular, I'll make the point about the difference between association and causality. But more on that shortly. First of all, how did I actually end up standing in front of you today? Well, to be perfectly honest, I should start by saying a key reason is this lady. This is my wife, Helen. Without her support throughout my entire career, I would not have been able to do half of the things that I have been able to do that I can now talk to you about today. So an early acknowledgement to the fact that everybody needs help, everybody needs support, my support comes from here. But I'd like to go further back in time. I'd like to take you all the way back to 1977. This was a good year for me. It's the year I was born. It wasn't such a good year for Elvis. Within a month of my birth, the king had died. Now here we have an early reminder of one of the key messages from my talk. Association does not equal causality. I promise you. Fast forward a little bit. Fast forward to 1986. I'm in my second year of junior school. And I remember hearing on Newsround, that source of information for every school kid. I remember hearing on Newsround about an accident that had taken place at a nuclear reactor in the Soviet Union. Now, Frankly, I've got very little clue what a nuclear reactor was. I'd got even less clue about what the implications of something like an accident at a nuclear reactor may be. So it's strange that 35 years on, I'm now standing here talking to you about exactly that. I developed a passion for research, and in particular for field research. Sometimes that research was exciting. I got to work with venomous reptiles. Sometimes that research was frustrating. Sampling pine trees after quite a few trees was very annoying. Took me to some lovely picturesque locations and some slightly less pleasant locations as well. Yes, that is a pre-breakfast study on a steaming pile of sewage sludge. So it's not all glamour. but actually influenced by some excellent scientists, and in particular, these two. For any of you that, that don't know them, you've got Professor David Copplestone on the left, Professor Nick Beresford on the right. And they really helped bring me into the sphere of radioecology, and I've loved it ever since. Since 2013, we've been working together in the Chernobyl exclusion zone. Chernobyl 
amazingly has gone from something that I heard about on Newsround to something that has now become a major, major part of my life. And the other thing that I really appreciate my wife for is her tolerance of the number of times that I talk about Chernobyl in my day-to-day -day life, and she never gets annoyed. The accident caused significant ecological damage at the time of the event, as you can see here. So top left corner, you see a picture of the area that is now known as the Red Forest. Prior to the accident, it was just called Forest. Since the accident, where we had a plume of contamination going through that area, resulting in death of pine trees and the needles turning that reddy brown color that you're all so used to seeing on Christmas trees. We, we got this area of highly contaminated radioactive earth, contamination within the ecosystem, and an area where, as I say, undoubtedly, there was significant ecological damage. So the zone has this place. It also has various other areas of differing levels of contamination. The red that you see on the screen on this map is where you have the highest contamination. You can see this finger extending out. This is the Western Trace. And actually the Red Forest is located here, right in the very hottest part of that Western Trace. But if you go through the zone, you drop down to these blue colors here. Now, areas in that blue patch are at UK natural background levels, but still within the exclusion zone. So from the perspective of research scientists, it's an amazing location to be able to go and work. We have a variety of different sites that we can study across a gradient of radiation to investigate the way in which radiation impacts on wildlife. We've used the zone as a natural laboratory within things like the tree project that's mentioned here. I'm not gonna show you this video now. There's a link that you've got which will take you to a video where you can learn more about the ways in which we've used the zone as a natural laboratory. So the science that can be undertaken in the zone is, to my mind, part of a very important chain of activity that helps to deliver practical radiation protection. We need that science. We need robust science that gives us clear messages. That science then needs to feed into regulation which is proportionate, which is fit for purpose, and which is obviously based on that sound science. The other element of practical radiation protection that I would highlight is something that, that Pete mentioned in his talk as well, and that's communication. These three elements are key to me if we're going to really deliver practical radiation protection. And they're three elements that I'm passionate about. So science informs regulation. That means the Chernobyl research that's undertaken has real world implications. It affects policy, it affects practice. So we need to ensure that the messages, the understanding that comes out of Chernobyl research are able to be used. There's been a wealth of research within the exclusion zone, but something is very apparent. And that is the fact that this consensus, this agreement, this view of how much radiation it really takes to impact on wildlife, and in particular populations of wildlife, is something that we're far from. If you look here, we've got over on the left, Two headlines from the BBC, we've got Chernobyl species decline linked to DNA and wildlife defies Chernobyl radiation. So two very contrasting headlines linked obviously to different studies that have been undertaken. 
Over on the right, we have another example. So we've got forests around Chernobyl aren't decaying properly. And we contrast that with the findings of this paper, which actually says that irrespective of radiation level, decay rates in the zone are pretty much the same. Now, this actually highlights an interesting point. Here, I was very easily able to find loads of headlines saying forests aren't decaying properly. Radiation has wiped out all of the things that break down forest material. The paper that says, actually, there isn't really an effect of radiation on decay. How much media attention do you think that got? Zero. A real lack of media profile. And this is a serious problem because it continues to build this skewed view of the world. This paper down at the bottom talks more about the scientific controversy that we face within radiation protection of the environment. And it's well worth having a look at because it highlights some of these challenges and some of the issues with some of the papers that have gone before. But I'm going to say some more about that as we go forward. I think it's important that we all acknowledge pitfalls within science, within research. I'm going to introduce you to two different scientists, each of whom has a view on some of the fundamental issues with research, research design and research interpretation. Both are from the medical field, but both of them have things to say which are completely transferable into our domain. First, Ben Goldacre, the author of Bad Science. Do me a favor, put your hand up if you've read Bad Science. Good, there's a few hands going up around the room. If you haven't, and I promise you I'm not getting commission for this, if you haven't, I'd recommend having a read. It's a really well-written book that highlights some of the fundamental issues that we face when looking at interpretation of research. Those issues include things like a, a lack of transparency and detail in the communication of research findings, a lack of reasoning being applied in the development of research findings. So, quite often we see this tendency for people to undertake a study and then report conclusions which are heavily influenced by their belief set rather than the evidence that they've collected. I'm also going to introduce you to John Ioannidis. Now, John takes things a step further. This 2005 paper caused a real storm. It's been incredibly highly cited, not surprisingly. Why most published research findings are false. That's quite a, a statement, isn't it? Now, whether or not you subscribe to the view that most published research is false, certainly the issues that he raises in so many of the papers that you look across within the scientific literature are valid. We face issues to do with bias, whether that be conscious or unconscious bias. We face issues to do with the statistical power of the studies. Where we have few studies, not well replicated, how do we really build a weight of evidence from these? And how do we know that one study saying one thing is right and the other one is wrong? Within work that we've been doing in the Chernobyl Exclusion Zone, we have tried to address some of the things, for example, around 
bias and also reproducibility. One of the problems with field research is, as a field scientist, quite often your data are collected through observations made in the field at a given time. So you'll stand there, you'll observe, and you'll record. Now, that's fine. It's been done for a long time, but how do you independently verify that the observations that have been made at that time point, at that location, are valid? What's more, if you're a scientist who has a bias, be that conscious or unconscious, perhaps a predisposition to assume that radiation is going to be causing an impact. It's really hard to undertake field research in somewhere like the Chernobyl exclusion zone and not be aware of the contamination level that you're standing in. You know, if I go and stand in the Red Forest and start doing some work, the beep, 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 that's coming from the EPD is going to tell me that I'm in a fairly high radiation level area. And inevitably, there's the potential that that could influence my observations. So from that innovation perspective, to overcome that challenge of bias, one of the things that we've done is we've tried to use, as far as possible, instruments to capture data independently of us. So, for example, motion-activated cameras, acoustic recorders, capturing photographs, audio recordings that we're then able to provide to somebody else and ask them to go through and make observations from. They don't know where those recordings came from. They don't know where those photographs came from. Suddenly, we're engineering some of that bias out of the system. Another point around research and, and research issues that I'd like to raise, I'm actually going to do with reference to one of my own papers. You know, all too often people criticize the work of others. We need to be honest and open and reflect on our own work as well. So this is a paper about small mammal gut microbial communities. These are small mammals from the Chernobyl exclusion zone, from various locations, including from the Red Forest. And the paper was published on the 35th anniversary of the accident. Within this study, we looked at four different species of small mammal. You'll see that there are these kind of double tracks here. Each double track is a species of small mammal. All of the rows are different components of the gut microbial community. And the color pattern that you see shows strength of association between radiation level and a particular element of that gut microbial community. Now, we didn't find any strong evidence of a clear and consistent association between radiation and gut microbial community. This is a finding that is at odds with a finding from another group that actually said, yes, we found a clear and consistent association. So we've got two papers that are saying different things. Who's right? Who's wrong? Do we know? Reality is, we don't know, do we? We just have two different studies. Each have found something different. Both of the studies have done something which Johnny and Edie's would raise questions about, which is they've tested a huge number of different variables against radiation to see where we see associations. Remember I said about that difference between association and causality? If you test a large enough number of association relationships, just by law of statistical probability, you're going to find some significant associations. 
You need to have reasoning behind the test that you're doing. There needs to be a logic behind why you're actually taking an approach to examine a particular relationship. So I can't stand here and tell you categorically the extent to which radiation impacts on gut microbiome. What I can do, though, is I can highlight this, which we see across each of the different organisms that we've looked at. And that is a notable difference between the first column and the second column. Why is that important? Well, that first column is associations against total dose rate. That's total dose rate where we've actually gone through, we've used the ERICA dose assessment tool, measured radionuclides within the organisms, calculate a total dose rate. This column is comparing just against ambient dose rate at each given site. Now, ambient dose rate has been used in many previous studies of radiation effects as a way of actually quantifying the radiation element within this. We see here clear evidence that if you use ambient versus total dose rate, you're going to come up with a different finding. You see that across each of the different sets. So irrespective of what the finding is, they're going to give you different interpretations. Ambient dose rate may well give us an indication of external exposure. We could potentially use it to get a bit of a sense of internal exposure if we can figure out maybe an approximation of cesium activity concentration in the environment and use concentration ratios to work out what goes into the organism. But in reality, ambient dose rates are blunt tool. And we need to move beyond that. Again, thinking about those innovations in practical radiation protection. You guys are all from the radiation protection arena. You understand that the total dose rate is a combination of both the external and the internal exposure. This is something which, unfortunately, many who are not from our field don't understand. They perhaps start to venture into the world of radiation effects studies, but without that fundamental understanding in place. To illustrate this a little bit further, I'll mention another study that we did out in the exclusion zone. Here, we collected representatives of various different organism groups. We measured the activity concentrations in the environment, we measured activity concentrations in the organisms, and we were able to then investigate the relative balance between external and internal dose rates. You see these black bars on this top right figure. The black bars represent the percentage contribution of external dose rate. The lighter gray is the percentage contribution of internal dose rate. So if you look at this figure, you can quite clearly see the internal dose rate can be contributing up to 90% of the total dose rate for some of these organisms in the exclusion zone. If we look down here, what we have is we have these light bars here, these empty bars, which are cesium-137. We have the gray bars, which are strontium-90. And then we have actinides with the darker gray and the black. So you can see that cesium-137 is an important contributor to the internal dose rate, but it's by no means 50% for anything. All of them are less than 50. Actually, strontium-90 really is a major contributor to the internal dose rate. This will probably come as no surprise to many of you, 
But actually, it's something that's really important to demonstrate and for people to consider when they're looking at radiation effects studies reported from the zone. It does clearly demonstrate that there is no use just using ambient dose rate measurements. It also highlights the fact that we need to measure activity concentrations within wildlife. Now, conventionally, within the world of radioecology, the approach that's been taken to measuring activity concentrations in wildlife is we go out into the environment, we collect our sample of whatever organism it is that we're studying, we euthanize it in some way, we freeze dry it, we blend it to a beautiful homogenous sample, and then we measure the activity concentrations. Go us, well done, right? So we get the numbers. Aside from the ethical questions, let's also try and remember the fact that the whole purpose behind all of this work is protection of the environment. There seems to be a degree of logical inconsistency here. So again, I'd like to mention another innovation. And it's an innovation that came about through Nick and I working with Pete Burgess supervising Ross Forks, who was one of our PhD students. And Ross did a brilliant PhD. He developed this detector system, designed, built at Salford with the help of John Cork Scientific. We now have a live monitor for small animals, which we can take out into the exclusion zone, and which will quantify both cesium-137 and strontium-90 within those animals. Great piece of kit, really useful, and we've used it to support our field research and actually reduce the number of animals that we need to then lethally sample as a result. Taking it out to the zone, you can see Ross actually in a house in Chernobyl um, working with the detector there. And also taking ambient dose rate measurements, we were able to compare total dose rate for individual animals against ambient dose rate, as may have been used many times before in previous studies. What you'll see here is that there is a heck of a lot of variation in the total dose rate at any given site with a particular ambient dose rate. So can you use ambient dose rate to help you do radiation effects study analysis? No, you can't. This is a really important finding. We need to be cognizant of this when we look at those different radiation effects studies, which are so often published. Another thing that we need to be cognizant of is the fact that when we undertake studies within somewhere like the Chernobyl exclusion zone, the sites at which we are working, the populations that we're studying, have a exposure history which is very different to a chronically exposed population near to a facility that's discharging continuously into the environment. We have a history where there was an immense release, really high dose rates, and then a decay away over time. So at this first time point, if we'd gone to our site and done a ambient dose rate measurement, or indeed a total dose rate measurement to figure out radiation dose rate for an organism of interest, it would have been huge. We go to that same site now, and it's much less. You can see a very big difference between the two. If we had a situation where we had this ongoing, bubbling away, chronic release, 
and we went to this position here at this time point and took a measurement, both of those sites would appear to be the same. The ambient dose rate would be the same, but actually the history, the dose history, is completely different. And this is something that we have to be able to get right. We have to be able to understand how what's happened in the past may be affecting what we see now in our field observations. But it's not just radiation history that will affect those observations. The Chernobyl exclusion zone has huge numbers of wildfires. Pete mentioned them before. Right? We've been undertaking studies of the impacts of these wildfires since the 2016 fires. And what is very apparent is that you can have significant fire damage at a site, which is likely to be much more associated with what you see in terms of the ecology that's there than the radiation. So what you have to keep in mind is the history of a site broadly, not just in terms of radiation, but in terms of, you know, has there been a fire event here in the past? These confounding factors are things that we mustn't overlook when we're trying to interpret radiation effects studies. The other thing that we mustn't overlook is the fact that no group is working in isolation within the Chernobyl exclusion zone. You know, the red forest that I mentioned is the most contaminated part of the zone. So if you want a high point on your dose effect relationship, then inevitably you're gonna to head to the red forest to do some of your studies. Now, this is also the area where the pine trees were killed at the time of the accident, so it has a weird ecological history. It's been subject to significant forest fires, so it has that fire history. And because everybody uses that site, and multiple groups are doing, for example, small mammal studies, actually around the same sort of time of year, because there's a good time of year to go out and sample small mammals, suddenly the trapping activity that I do at this particular point on this week and then disappear off actually will affect the trapping activity that somebody else comes and does the next week. So one of the things that we also need to understand is how all of these different studies fit together, how the information sets align such that we understand whether a seeming reduction in animal numbers is much more to do with the fact that there's another group that's just trapped out the site the week before than anything to do with radiation. We also need to think about other aspects of human disturbance. Within the zone, we have an area that was heavily managed from an agricultural perspective, from a forestry perspective. That management obviously created a particular type of landscape. Since the time of the accident and the abandonment of this area, there has been a process of plant succession taking place, an entirely natural process. The environment will change over time when you remove that management influence. And we see, for example, where you can see that building just disappearing into the trees. We see that influence quite apparently. What we have now, though, is we have a new human pressure coming to the zone. That human pressure is in the form of tourism. Now, the HBO series on Chernobyl that I'm sure that many of you will have seen was a really good series. I think it was a, a, a really good thing for people to watch and, and to understand a little bit more about what happened. It perhaps continued to portray that grey, crumbling, derelict, wasteland-type view of the zone, um, which we continue need to try and dispel. But it did also infuse lots more tourists to come and visit Chernobyl. Numbers went through the roof. And they're now talking about increasing ecotourism. Now, this is where I start to get a little bit concerned. Because 
although radiation may not be great for wildlife, certainly not at high levels, actually the disturbance influence of humans is far greater. When people were taken out of the zone, the wildlife has flourished. We see an amazing diversity of wildlife there now. If we bring that human pressure back in, then clearly that disturbance factor starts to return and the conservation benefits that we currently see from Chernobyl will begin to diminish. The other thing about the tourism activity that needs to be recognized when we're thinking about interpreting effect studies, which include the Red Forest, is the Red Forest is right near the technical area of the zone, near to the reactor complex, so it has a lot of the industrial activity disturbance. And unsurprisingly, this area is also the area where all the <laughs> tourists want to go. So we have a high study site in an area with potentially quite high human disturbance. So again, we mustn't overlook this when we're thinking about interpreting findings. So I think through those particular examples, that's kind of illustrated some of the issues around transparency and detail and use of reasoning within science studies. And also issues around things like the power, the bias of the studies, and also the reproducibility of those studies. Something that John Ioannidis really pushes is the importance of negative as well as positive relationships being published. So that's a, a negative finding, i.e. I tested my hypothesis and found no association with radiation, as well as the positives. Because that then gives you an opportunity to look at a weight of evidence properly when you consider the literature for the purposes of meta-analysis. Now, currently, in the environmental plant animal type sciences, relative to, for example, the medical sciences, we're quite good at also publishing negative findings. But remember what I said about that issue with trying to find a headline for the negative finding publication. As researchers are continuously pushed to have greater and greater profile for their research, inevitably there is the potential that we start to get people doing headline chasing, which can start to then affect the quality of these weight of evidence analyses that can be undertaken. We said about science and its contribution to practical radiation protection. We also need to consider the, the way in which we can innovate to improve the regulation policy angle. One of the developments that's coming online is the adverse outcomes pathway concept, AOP. Now this is something that has been around in about 10 years or so, developed through the OECD, used in chemical risk assessment, ecotoxicology, and is starting to move through into the world of radiation protection. This is a kind of watch this space for you, but I really like it and I would really like to see more of the use of this. I participated in a workshop earlier this year. We spent a week brainstorming how we could really bring this into radiation protection. And for me, there are two key things that I particularly like about this. What it does is it forces you to explore causal relationships, not just associations. And it provides a framework for you to organize the evidence and evaluate the weight of different sections of that evidence so that you can decide how confident you really are in any of those adverse outcome pathways. So again, challenges, innovations, this is one of those innovations that's coming online that will help, I think, to further improve radiation protection and development of regulation 
into the future. I also mentioned communication. Increasingly, I think we recognize that communication is essential for the radiation protection community to embrace. But it's not something that comes easily to lots of us. Many people have spent their lives within that much more scientific, technical arena. That communication with stakeholders is something that they're not immediately ready to embrace. We've done quite a lot of work communicating with, for example, communi communities in the environs of the Chernobyl exclusion zone. Communities that live bordering the zone, but don't go in there. They don't really understand what's happening within there, and they really, amazingly, don't understand an awful lot about radiation. Obviously, through SRP, we've done lots of communication activity. We've communicate, communicated at government level, um, so Houses of Parliament. Um, we've also done a lot of outreach activity, and it's through outreach activity that I started to work on this, which Pete mentioned as well, development of virtual Chernobyl. Now, if you're looking for innovation in communication, and you're thinking about the fact that you need people to be able to formulate their own views, their own perspectives, you know, provide them with the information, but let them work with that information themselves. There is nothing more powerful than being able to say, look, I'm not just going to stand here and tell you what a particular site is like in Chernobyl. I'm going to let you go there. Obviously, I can't take you there physically, but I can give you a VR headset and allow you to go and explore these different locations for yourself and start to formulate your own perspectives on this place. So virtual Chernobyl, I've used actually for education in Ukraine. I've used it for working with local stakeholder groups. I've also used it for training people from Fukushima Prefecture to help them understand how you might start to speak with members of the public and begin to engage them in discussions around radiation and radiation risk. Similarly, I've been out to Thailand. And again, I've worked with people from the Office of Atoms for Peace in Thailand, trying to help them understand how to talk to their publics, their communities. So Virtual Chernobyl has been a great tool. It continues to be developed. We're actually just preparing to launch Virtual Chernobyl 2. It was delayed slightly as a result of all of this awkward COVID thing that's been going on, but we're getting there now. Um, the website for Virtual Chernobyl is there. I'd encourage you to take a look at it. What you'll see at the minute is a really rough website. I mean, like the world's most basic website. It's just enough to act as a placeholder. Hopefully within the next month or so, the new version of the website will go live, at which point you'll have access to all sorts of different resources associated with Virtual Chernobyl. You'll also have the ability, in fact, you do have the ability now to download a brief trailer, so if you've got a VR headset at home or even just on a tablet, you can explore it yourself. But you'll have that opportunity moving forward to download the full version of Virtual Chernobyl and really be able to explore the zone, the places where we work, and formulate your own perspectives. It's great to see within the SRP that we have a thriving, rising generations group. These are just a few faces associated with the group's committee. I'm particularly delighted to say that my PhD student, Helen Whitehead, has joined the group, has taken on the role of secretary. It's really rewarding to see this new blood, if you like, within the radiation protection community. And we've got to make sure that continues. I was also really proud when Helen told me that she was writing a feature article for the inaugural issue of the great magazine that Pete just introduced you to. So again, we need to do all we can to encourage newer members to come in and 
and become part of our community. We obviously do this through things like schools events where we try and infuse that really young generation to come up and join us. And such enthusiasm has also actually manifested itself in my own kits. So Abigail has been to science festivals with me, helping to introduce people to some of the science that we do in the exclusion zone, pre-COVID I might add. Um, Eleanor has become really interested in scientific experimentation and is there getting ready to do a science kit experiment. So practical radiation protection, as I say, it needs science, it needs regulation, it needs communication. Ultimately, all of that sits within the need to develop a really strong radiation protection culture. I think it's incumbent on us, who are perhaps slightly further on in our careers, to share what we've learned with the next generation of professionals and help continue to develop the profession into the future. I think, to a large extent, that is what the John Dunster lecture is about. It's about sharing experience and helping to build that enthusiasm. I am truly humbled to sit now amongst the Dunster lecturers. I mean, just look at the names around there. These are, these are the absolute giants of radiation protection. And to now be the 10th Dunster lecturer, and dare I say it, the youngest, I really am delighted. So thank you for listening.